Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Let me say a word for everyone. just heard earlier where a person was talking to someone and they went straight to their pastor and they didn't want to talk no more. I've had that experience myself. But the spirit of prophecy says there's something that we're doing that keep people from listening to us. And a lot of people ask me, is this a salvational issue? Should we really be talking about this? Well, how about this right here? Look what she says right here. The spirit which attends the one cannot be in harmony with the other. There is a spirit behind this movement. There's either, either you're pushing God's spirit or you're pushing Satan's spirit. And this is what we want to bring out. This, throughout this whole series, this quote is the one I'm hanging everything on. Because, look what it says. You miser, might as well sever all connection with the third angel's message. As Adventists, we know we have a message, the three angels message. But notice she didn't say three angels. She said third angels message. The third angels message is the message that has the sealing, God's sealing it. It is the loud cry. So she's saying that if you join with this spirit, you will not receive the sealing. Did you catch that there? If you join with this, you might as well sever it because you cannot. There's two different spirits. The third angel is only going to fall upon those who have the what? The spirit of the living God. So she's saying with this, there's a spirit that goes along with it. And because we have done this, people refuse to listen to us. So we want to address that. We want to get... Listen here. So in Life Sketches 408.3 reads, Then I further dwelt upon the supreme rulership of God above all the earthly rulers. His law is to be the standard of action. Men are forbidden to pervert their senses by intemperance or by yielding their minds to satanic influences. 
for this makes impossible the keeping of God's law. While the divine ruler bears long with perversity, he is not deceived and will not always keep silence. His supremacy, his authority as ruler of the universe must finally be acknowledged and the just claims of his law vindicated. All right, so look what he says right here. We are not to what? Yield our minds to satanic influences. What? For this makes it impossible for the keeping of God's law. She doesn't say might be, she says impossible. Whenever we yield to any type of satanic influences, we will not be able to keep God's law. How many of us want to keep God's law? All of us, right? Nothing is, the other thing is what she said, our what? Diet, intemperance, our diet. But not just intemperance doesn't just represent the diet, it's primarily. But remember, Paul says, we must be tempered in what? Those who are striving for the mastery must be tempted in what? All things. So she's telling us here that we have to be tempered, but we cannot what? Satanic influence. And this is where we fail a lot of times. We might get a little bit on temperance, but we forget, and we have satanic influences around us. And it will keep us. And people say, oh, man, why am I keep falling into the same trap? You have to check to see what satanic influences are around you that are keeping you from keeping God's law. Mm -hmm. All right? Okay. All right. It reads, the law of love being the foundation of the government of God, the happiness of all intelligent beings depends upon their perfect accord with its great principles of righteousness. God desires from all his creatures the service of love, service that springs from an appreciation of his character. He takes no pleasure in a forced obedience, and to all he grants freedom of will that they may render him voluntarily service. All right, we talked about two spirits, right? Two spirits. This is God's spirit. Right? He grants us free will. If God wanted to be a tyrant, would he give you free will? No. No. And then he says right here that he's not going to force you. He wants you to obey him through what? For appreciation of his character. What do you render him to? Like voluntary service. God is going to show you through his character why you should serve him. Why you should love him. Remember what it says? We've seen that song already. Because he first loved us. So let's see, as we go through this series, we want to identify this is one spirit. One that allows freedom and allows you to come voluntarily. But there's going to be another spirit that doesn't do that. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Yeah. There. So if you have your Bibles, or you can look on the screen, Ezekiel 28, it says, Thou art the anointed church that covers that, and I have said thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. All right. So here we now talking about Lucifer, the covering chair. I want you to notice, we all know this, so I'm just going to be brief with this one. The covering chair. Who set him as a covering chair? God did, right? So God has an order. I want you to remember this. God has an order. Too often we talk about the law of God, but we also got to remember it. it's law and order. God has an order. It was God that set him as a covering chariot. Lucifer was set in that position for a purpose. But it was because of him. He was perfect when he was in that order. But it was him. He decided. We're going to look into that. What did Lucifer do that caused him to come from perfect to imperfect? That's the question we have to ask. What did he do? Did you guys see the screen? Am I blocking? No. Okay, let me make sure that was done. All right, so here we go. So it says here, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. Mm. I, we all read this before, but I just want to put a couple of things. The angels. How many of us have seen heaven? Anyone seen heaven? <laughs> no, no, right? But I want you to think about this. But the angels did. The angels saw heaven. Think about this for a second. We've never seen it. But the angels did. 
they stood before the Father. Yet Lucifer was able to get them to rebel, rebel against the Father, who they saw. So if they seen all of heaven, saw all the universe, seen the unfallen worlds, but we, who've never seen any of those, how much more easier for us to fall if he was able to convince them? That's the point I want to make in this presentation. It wasn't obvious. I know I saw that you saw the word feminism. Feminism is what we call it, but that's not the spirit was in heaven. I'm going to show you that same spirit is the spirit that caused the angels who saw all of creation, who saw all the planets being made, still distrusted God. And they stood in the presence of God and they distrusted him. We've never seen that. Never have we seen it. So if he was able to get angels to distrust God, what about us? Do you understand? This is what's important about this. There was a war in heaven, and this war started over. Let's put it as a, I don't want to get ahead of myself. <clears throat> so Peter and Prophet it reads, 42.1, God could employ only such means as were consistent with truth and righteousness. Satan could use what God could not, flattery and deceit. He had sought to falsify the word of God and had misrepresented his plan of government, claiming that God was not just in imposing laws upon the angels, that in requiring submission and obedience from his creatures, he was seeking merely the exaltation of himself. It was therefore necessary to demonstrate before the inhabitants of heaven and of all the worlds that God's government is just. His law is his law perfect. Satan had made it appear that he himself was seeking to promote the good of the universe. The true character of the usurper of and his real object must be understood by all. He must have time to manifest himself by his wicked works. All right. So here it is right here. God could never use, watch this, he could only use truth and righteousness. That's the character. That's the character of God, love, truth and righteousness. But Satan could what? Falsify. He could deceive. He can make you feel good <coughs> to get you to do stuff that you don't want to do. But watch this. But God says what? All must. Sometimes we wonder, why did God think about this? Right? Smith prophecy says that in Grenada. But she says it would have been easy for God to destroy the angels and just as easy for us to pick up a stone and throw it in the water. But God didn't do that. He didn't do it because what? He wanted all to see what that spirit was. We must understand the differences between the spirit and make a choice. We have a choice either to accept God or to reject him. We have what? Free will. God has given us that. He has set the order. We can choose. And this is what he's saying here. We all must understand. And that's the purpose of this, this presentation is to break down those two characteristics <laughs> that we can make a choice on them. <coughs> here they are. The two spirits. We have Christ, which is Michael. We understood the war. Michael and his angels. And then we have Satan and his angels. But look at this. Christ, his characteristics is what? The Satan. Can you guys see that? Of love. All right. And then Satan's character is what? Those are the two. This one, no matter what you do, you're going to eat that one of these spirits no matter what you do it will be one of these two spirits alright so in spirit of prophecy volume 1 it reads he left the immediate presence of the father dissatisfied and filled with envy against Jesus Christ concealing his real purposes he assembled the angelic host he introduced his subject which was himself as one agreed, he related the preference God had given Jesus to the neglect of himself. He told them that henceforth all the sweet liberty the angels had enjoyed was at an end. Hmm. Concealing, that's deceitful, right? He so good. He up the position. I want you guys to notice this. Did God set him in a position? Did God take him out of that position? No. Satan left. Because of his attitude. God did not kick Satan out of it. God was trying to win. When you read the Torah, I didn't put it in, it could be too long. She says that when God realized that what was 
working in Satan's heart, he called all the angels together to, to make the position known of who his son was. And that purpose was to win Satan back to him through love because he could not force Satan to come back. He wooed him back. So look what it says right here. I want you to notice, what did he tell the angels? That what? The sweet what? Liberty was what? At an end. See, there was harmony in heaven. He's telling them now. Watch this now. All right. Okay, so read it. For he, for had not a ruler been appointed over them, to whom they from henceforth must yield servile honor, he stated to them that he had called them together to assure them that he no longer would submit to this invasion of his rights and theirs, that never would he again bow down to Christ, that he would take the honor upon himself, which should have been conferred upon him, and would be the commander of all who would submit to follow and him and obey his voice. And obey his voice. Look at it right here. All right. Servile honor. Keep that phrase. We also would deal with what? The invasion of their what? His rights and whose? The angels' rights. I want you to keep that in mind as we go through the series. And take honor upon himself. Self-exaltation, right? Then he goes on. Get them to what? Obey his voice. Whose voice are you obeying? His or God's? The next one says. And here it says, There was contention among the angels. Satan and his sympathizers were striving to reform the government of God. They were discontented and unhappy because they could not look into his unsearchable wisdom and ascertain his purposes <coughs> in exalting his son Jesus and endowing him with such unlimited power and command. They rebelled against the authority of the son. All right. Remember, Satan was the one that was jealous of, of Jesus. But look what he was trying to do? Reform the government of God. And why? Because they couldn't look into the what? Unsearchable wisdom. A lot of times God tells us to do stuff. And because we can't look into the other side, we what? We disobey. You have to be careful about it. Just because you don't know. It's like a child, right? I tell my child, stop. I may not explain why I stop. But he should automatically listen to me because he's my child. And I have his best interest. Does God have our best interest at heart? Yes. And sometimes we don't know what God's plans are. We don't know them. But Satan tries to get us to think about it. Well, reason it out. Try to figure it out before you do it. And guess what? It leads to what? Falling. We separate ourselves by not listening. And this is what he did to the angels. It says here, Satan refused to listen, and then he turned from the loyal and true angels, denouncing them as slaves. These angels, true to God, stood in amazement as they saw the Satan, that Satan was successful in his effort to excite rebellion. He promised them a new and better government than they then had, in which all would be freedom. Great numbers signified their purpose to accept Satan as their leader and chief commander. As he saw his advances were met with success, he flattered himself that he should yet have all the angels on his side, and that he would be equal with God himself, and his voice of authority would be heard in commanding the entire host of heaven. Mm. All right, buzzwords here. We should get hurry on. See right here, denouncing them as slaves. Remember that as a as a buzzword. All right, look over here. Right. New and better government. That he could do better than what God could do. That was his purpose here. And then he also offered them all what? Buzzword. Freedom. These are buzzwords that we need to remember. Were they already? God has already given you what? Free will. So they were already free. Think about this second. They were already free. God didn't force anyone. He gave them a position. This is your job. This is your job. This is your job. I'm not going to make you do it. You do it because of what? Out of appreciation of his character. But Satan miscommuted and said that God was doing it out of his what? He was exalting himself. He wasn't exalting himself. He was already exalted. He's God. He created all of them. But look how Satan did it. And then he was what? He was flattered himself that he should what? Gain all angels. That's lifting himself up. We talked about that. Self-exaltation. Satan tried to rise to the position of God. God had put him in a position and then he had tried to rise above it. That's one of the characteristics of this spirit. Next one. 
And this is what the war heaven was about. We always said it was war in heaven. But what was it about? What was the actual reason there was a war in heaven other than Satan? Because we understand that Satan tried to rise above. But how did he get the other angels to go along with him? And those angels that decided not to go, he denounced them as slaves. That's a buzzword. We want to remember that. All right, let's listen to it. No. Amen. Okay. Again, the loyal angels warned Satan and assured him what must be the consequence if he persisted. That he who could create the angels could by his power overturn all their authority and in some signal manner punish their audacity and terrible rebellion. To think that an angel should resist the law of God, which was as sacred as himself. They warned the rebellious to close their ears to Satan's deceptive reasonings and advised Satan and all who had been affected by him to go to God and confess the wrong for even admitting a thought of questioning his authority. Mm. Watch this right here. How many of us actually go out and try to speak to people and what do they do? They want us what? We try to get them to do it and they have that same spirit. You're trying to preach them, you're trying to tell them the truth and they look at you as you're an enemy. They say, we can, once you see it, you'll start recognizing the spirits as we try to share. But the question is, is are we recognizing the spirits in our own life? Are we actually looking at our own actions, self-examining? Who am I representing when I go to talk to people? Am I representing Satan? And that's why they're not listening because how can Satan cast out Satan? All right? So we need to examine. This is all this is, is just education for ourselves. Look how Satan fell. Go ahead. Little by little, Lucifer came to indulge the desire for self-exaltation. The scripture says, Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted by thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Ezekiel 20, verse 17. Thou hast said in thy heart, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. Isaiah 14, verse 13 and 14. Though all his glory was from God, this mighty angel came to regard it as pertaining to himself. There it is right there. Little by little, and that's the question for us. This is how Satan felt. He didn't just fall one by one. It was little things that he pondered in his mind about himself and lift him. Oh, I'm so good looking. Oh, I'm so good with music. Oh, these little things that started to add up over time. So when we look at ourselves, we can see that this is how he felt. This mighty angel who's seen everything. He was up there, right below God. If he fell by that, then are we little by little? Are we lifting ourselves up little by little? I'm so good at this. Oh, I'm this, I'm that. Is that the character of Christ? Is that the, or whose character it is when I start to look at myself and start saying, oh man, look how good I'm at this. Remember, God does give us talents. Just like he gave Lucifer talents. But Lucifer started to take those talents as if it was his rather than a gift from God. That's what we have to remember. Anything that we're good at is because it's a gift from God. Amen. All right? And that's the problem that Lucifer had. We don't want that spirit. And so it reads, not content with his position, though honored above the heavenly host, he ventured to covet homage due alone to the creator. Instead of seeking to make God supreme in the affections and allegiance of all created beings, it was his endeavor to secure their service and loyalty to himself. And coveting the glory with which the infinite father and had invested his son, the prince, this prince of angels, Aspire to power that was the prerogative of Christ alone. Mm. Mm. Two things on this one here. Covetousness. Thou shalt not work covered. We also do this. This is how Satan gets us with this one. We see somebody with a talent and we awe at that talent. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wish I could sing like so-and-so. Oh, I wish I had a voice. Oh, I wish I looked like so-and-so. Rather than saying praise God that they look that way. Praise God that they have that ability and give honor to God. Always giving honor to God. When we start to internalize what other people are doing, this is what Lucifer did. He started looking at the power of God. Well, actually, it wasn't even the Father, if you actually read it, it was the Son. He was looking at it, Michael, the angel. He's like, well, wait a minute. Why has Michael got more than I got? Because I can do this. I can do this. And I can do this. I can do this. 
So if I can do all these things, then I should have the power, be in the position of Michael. Mm. And that's what he started doing. He started covering by looking at what he had and then also looking at what Christ had. Well, wait, 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 wait. I want to be like that person. He started to emanate. And that emanating led him to, to rebel. We have to be careful. We should be more Christ-like, not imitating or emulating those around us. Now the perfect harmony of heaven was broken. Lucifer's disposition to serve himself instead of his creator aroused a feeling of apprehension when observed by those who considered that the glory of God should be supreme. In heavenly counsel, the angels pleaded with Lucifer. The Son of God presented <coughs> before him the greatness, the goodness, and the justice of the creator and the sacred, unchanging nature of his law. God himself had established the order of heaven, and in departing from it, Lucifer would dishonor his maker and bring ruin upon himself. But the warning given in infinite love and mercy only aroused a spirit of resistance. Lucifer allowed his jealousy of Christ to prevail and became the more determined. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. God himself had established the order of heaven. Is there an order on earth? Did he establish an order? Did he establish an order in the church? Right? If we depart from that order, guess what we become? What spirit do we take on? Thank you. This is the thing we have to remember. The war in heaven started with Lucifer, what? Going against the order of heaven. <clears throat> That's what the war was about. The right parting from it, right? So what did he try to do to us? Get us to what? Yeah. Depart. Yeah. Exactly. So the only way that we can reconnect with the <clears throat> Father is to what? Get in order. Mm. See, when you step out of order, you're disconnected. But when you're in order, God has established the order. Not me, not anyone else, not man. God laid that up. And Satan keeps trying to get us to think that we can choose the order. <laughs> we can make the orders. Oh, no, I like doing this. Oh, no, I believe this. What could you make? No matter what you think about, you can't make it real. It's just a thought. But God can make it real because he's the creator. But this is how, he's, this is how he deceives us. He deceives us by making us think that we can create the order. Even in the churches, there's a way that we're supposed to run our churches. Guess what? Do we do that? No, we're out of order. <laughs> It was the highest sin to rebel against the order and will of God. All heaven seemed in commotion. The angels were marshaled in companies with a commanding angel at their head. All the angels were astir. Satan was insinuating against the government of God. Ambitious to exalt himself and unwilling to submit to the authority of Jesus. Some of the angels sympathized with Satan in his rebellion. And others strongly contended for the honor and wisdom of God in giving authority to his son, and there was contention with the angels. Satan and his affected ones were who were striving to reform the government of God, wished to look into uh, his unsearchable wisdom to ascertain his purpose in exalting Jesus, and endowing him with such unlimited power and command. All right, there's a rebellion. The will and order of God, right? They rebel against the order and the will of God. The question I have to ask for us, are we doing the same? I have to stress this because God has an order and we keep going against it. And if we go against it, whose side are we on? Thank you. We cannot, we cannot reform the government of God. We're not as strong as the angels and they couldn't do it. So why do we keep trying? Why do we keep trying? Why do we keep trying to think that we can reason God's wisdom? God is all-knowing. I can't tell you what's happening tomorrow or the next moment. How then can I reason what is right and what is wrong? And this is the problem. We have to stop and say, you know what? It's not my will, but what? God's will. There's an order. There's an order in the church. There's an order in the universe. And there's an order in the home. This is why I named it that title. <clears throat> and it reads, They rebelled against the authority of the Son of God. And all the angels were summoned to appear before the Father to have their cases decided. And it was decided that Satan should be expelled from heaven and that the angels, all who joined with Satan in the rebellion, 
truth should be turned out with him. Then there was war in heaven. Angels were engaged in the battle. Satan's wish to conquer the Son of God and those who were submissive to his will. But the good and true angels prevailed and Satan with his followers was driven from heaven. Mm. All right. This word right here, submissive, is always a bad word to see in life. But it's actually true. It's a good word. It's just the determinant of who are you submitting to? That's the question. Who are you submitting to? Are you submitting to Satan's will, whether it be well known and unknown? Because remember, you can just submit to Satan whether you know it or not. But you cannot submit to God without knowing. You, it, it's a voluntary thing. It's a conscious decision because God does not use deceit. So in order to submit to God, you have to know. But guess what? You can be on Satan's side and not even know it. Because he can use deception. God cannot. And that's something to remind when you think about something. Is this a deception? And the only way to determine whether something is a deception is through what? The law of God and the testimonies. If they, if they don't record in this, there's what? No light in it. That's the only way. But Satan is constantly trying to draw us away from that. So that we would end up turning around and submitting him without even knowing it. Don't even know you're on his side when you you are. Okay, so Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 to 12, it reads, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. But the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony. And they left not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the, of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but for a short time. All right, so let's get some ray of hope. A ray of hope, because it was all gloom. But look at it. It says what? I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation. And the strength and the kingdom of his God for the power of his what? Christ. Let me ask you this. When did this loud voice be pronounced in heaven? Anyone know? Oh, 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 oh. Let's, let's, let's look at it. Then. Ready? Yeah. There was war in heaven. Yeah. Based on this right here, the war in heaven is over. 12. Rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. So the war in heaven is over. When was the war in heaven over? It's, it's right there in the first one. Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. When was it over? When Jesus comes again? No. no. When Jesus died on the on cross. cross. There you go, my sister. Yeah. When Jesus died on the cross, I want you to see the difference. Satan's character was that he tried to exalt himself and push himself up saying how good I am, how good I am. Look how powerful I am, look how beautiful I am, look how good I am with music. He, that's how he, the war started. And then he got the angels saying, listen, if you don't join, you're gonna become slaves. And you're gonna now that Christ has been shown. But remember, Christ already had all power. Yeah. But it was saying that was deceiving them that now that Christ, that the Father has made known exactly who Christ was, that you become slaves, your freedom is gone. But well, look right here. Did Christ win the war through exalting himself? He was God. Look at the character difference. He came as a human being and died. He left his throne to come down. Do you see the difference in the two powers? One spirit tries to lift yourself up. The spirit of God is, I love you so much that I will lower myself to be able to save you. This is what God is saying here. So when Christ, the war started in heaven, when the angels saw their creator die on the cross, they understood that Satan was a loose liar. Understand that right there. This took place at the cross. The war in heaven. Now they always say this, and look at verse 11. It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Who is that speaking about? They. They overcame him. 
Is it? Have you overcome? No. Are you still struggling? So it says, woe unto the heavens of the earth. Have you overcome? No. Watch this. This is talking about the angels in the unfallen worlds. Do you see that? This is talking about the angels in the unfallen worlds. Remember the war took place where? In heaven. The war is now over. So who, who won? The angels and the unfallen worlds. They love not their lives unto death. You see, watch this. I want you to understand because this is very good for us. You have a choice. Does all beings have free will? Yes. yes. The angels had to make a choice. Either they go with Satan's rebellion or they stay with God. Did they actually know? They didn't know which one was right. But there was angels and the unfallen world said, listen, I hear what you're saying, Satan, but I'm going to have faith in God. They overcame by faith because they didn't understand. That's why he said we should, that's why God allowed Satan to do his things, that all may see who he really is. Because if God would have got rid of them, then people would not have served God out of love. They would have served him out of fear. So what God did was is he allowed Satan to demonstrate his, his true character and where it leads so that all will know and make a choice. Because remember the slide we have before, that we are to love God, serve God out of appreciation of his character. So when Christ died on the cross, the character that he displayed by coming from the throne, being the creator, and coming down and dying and suffering all that for humans that don't even love him. That displayed to the angels and the unfallen worlds his true character. And they saw how bad Satan wanted to hurt Christ. They saw his character. This is what the spirit of prophecy says about it. Yeah, because this is. Okay, so in Ephesians chapter oh. 6, verse 10 to 12, it reads Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now we can better understand this. By knowing what the war in heaven is about, watch what the Spirit of Prophecy says here. That we what? We put on the whole armor of God that we may what? Able to stand against the wiles of Satan. By understanding what the war in heaven is about, by understanding the differences between the two characters, we can better understand which side we want to be on. Because we now understand, we can see that. I understand it though. Hey, you know, she had me a bottle of water. I said, oh, it's water. But what if she put something in it? If I could see it and see what it was made of, I could say well, whether I wanted it or not, right? And this is what he's doing here. We're warring against. We're not warring against this person or that person or that person, that person. There are evil angels influencing people. And when I look at someone, they do something bad to me. I can't look at that person. That's why the Bible says you're supposed to what? Love your enemies. Because there are evil angels influencing people to do things wrong. Amen. And there are good angels trying to get you to do what? Right. That's why we pray for protection. That the angels come and push back the battle. That war is going on around us. And we should walk as though we understand that what's going on around us is because there's angels going on. There are good angels and bad angels. And that war still continues. In heaven is what? Harmony now. Because the war is over. We have to decide when will this war be over? <clears throat> when will this war be over? When we can replicate God's character. We have to make a choice. Yeah. Okay, and so it reads. Yeah, go ahead. It reads, hereafter I will sorry. Do you see a picture? Okay. Here hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. Mm. Okay, this is Jesus now. Jesus came, he came to fight the war. But look what he said. For the prince of this world cometh and what have what? Nothing. nothing in me. There was nothing in characters Christ that the Satan could use against him. No. Oh, you want victory? That's it right there. Nothing in me. Go to God and get cleansed. Amen. 
See, when I come to God, don't let Satan deceive you. You can go to God because he'll come to you from what? All unrighteousness. So that when Satan comes to you, he has nothing in you that he can use against you. Amen. Right? That's the victory right there. Christ has already showed us how to do it. But why did he do it? But the what? Let's read this together, 31. Can you guys see that? Yep. Yep. Let's read it together. What does it say? That's our battle cry. Yeah. That's our battle cry. Why? The Father, God so loved the world that he gave his what? Son. Son. So arise and go henceforth. Don't play with the devil anymore. That's what he's saying here. This is what Christ is saying. You can be cleansed from all unrighteousness that the sins that you had were no longer. God says he separates them from what? East from West. They never come together. But guess what? God will never bring them back together, but you can bring them back. See, you go and ask God for forgiveness, and now God forgives you, and he cleanses you, and then the devil comes back and treats you and says, guess what? You know you want that. And he doesn't say it. You know you want it. He says in your ear, I want that. And what does he do by doing that? He gets you to question whether God has already given you the victory. See, God is not a man that he should what? Lie. So when God says he cleanses you, if you come and ask for you repent, I will cleanse you. Matter of fact, in Ezekiel 33, it tells you that he will what? Never bring your sins. No more. He will not remember your sins. So if you're remembering your sins, who's it coming from? Yeah. Fact, let's quote it real quick. Ezekiel 33. Got your Bibles? Ezekiel 33. I just want you to see that. Ezekiel 33. And look at verse 15. So let's quote it real quick. I'm going to try to make this quick. I'm sorry, guys. But, no, but you got to see it. Ezekiel. Ezekiel 33. Okay. And let's look at verse 15. Mm -hmm. Yep. You got it? Everyone got it? Let's read it, dude. Let's read it. Verse 15. What does it say? Everyone read it together. All right. Restore the pledge. And what? Walk in the statutes of life without committing an iniquity. Look at the next verse. Oh, verse. None of his sins that he had committed shall be mentioned unto him. He has done that which is lawful and right. None he shall surely live. None of your sins shall be mentioned unto you. So when you go to God, how do I bring this back up? Okay? So none of your sins shall be mentioned unto you. So when you're sitting here and saying you skin those thoughts, reminding you of the sins that you've already confessed, who do you think is doing that? Who is it that's doing that? That's Satan. Yeah. Satan is trying to get you to go back to what you were before after God has already cleansed you. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to deceive you that God is not a God of his word. But God said none of your sins will be mentioned to you. So how many times you sit and say, oh, Lord, I'm so bad, look what I've done. How many times you've had that thought? <laughs> you know, many times, right? Now we know where it comes from. See, God does not remind you of the things that you've done. He only reminds you if you haven't gotten what? Cleansed. Because he's trying to draw you back to himself. And that's what he's trying to do. So he reminds you that, hey, the sin is on your book. He tries to remind you that these <clears throat> sins are on your book so that you may what? Return to him. He's trying to woo you back so that you can be saved because he wants to what? Save us. He loves us. He wants us to bring us out of darkness into righteousness. That's what he wants to do. So that Ezekiel 33 is letting you know that when you are thinking about 
an old sin or something you've done that you haven't confessed, it's Satan trying to get you to go back, making you feel like, oh, you can never reach. What is our goal? Our goal is to get to heaven. Amen. Right? Jacob's ladder. Watch this. Oh, this is great. Jacob's ladder. If you stand at the bottom and look up, you say, well, oh, wow, that's too far to go. I will never make it. <laughs> that's what Satan wants you to do. Satan wants you to do what? Stand at the bottom and look up. Oh, Lord, I, I can't make that. That's too far. Yeah. God never said that. God doesn't give you more than you can handle. What he wants you to do is look where you're at. Work on one at a time. Don't worry about that. Have faith that he'll keep you from what? Falling. Falling. That's what he wants to do. But Satan wants you to look up. He wants you to look up and see how bad it's. Oh, and then he also wants you to look down. Oh, man, look how far. Oh, look how bad I am. That's not Satan. That's Satan's character. That's not God's character. God is loving. And in Galatians 2, verse 20, it says, read together, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you see that character? Is that the character of Satan? Has he given himself for you? No. no. Then why do you keep giving him so much power in your life? God is the one who died for you that you can live. So we need to surrender because self is Satan's character. Selflessness. Let self die. Let Christ live in your heart. Because guess what? Christ, we in Maine, right? When you get a snowstorm and you're walking down the street and there's a bunch of snow, what's the easiest place to walk? Where nobody has walked or where the footprints are? Okay, guys, further. Christ has already walked that path for us. Amen. All we need to do is walk in his footsteps. We ain't got to go and try to make a whole new path. See, Satan wants you because then you get frustrated. Oh, goodness, so much snow. But if you walk in the footprints of Christ, things will be much easier. And that's the problem we're having is, is we keep following Satan off the path. <laughs> off the path. Satan keeps pushing either to the left side of the path or to the right. That's the difference which side you pick. They're both off the path. So I read, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Oh, what? Wait, wait, wait. Look at this right here. Let no man deceive you. Notice that right there? He that doeth righteous is what? Was we born righteous? No. 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 But no matter how much righteous I do, guess what? When I'm born again, am I born again righteous? Amen. Yes. So how do I stay righteous? Look right here. Verse 6. That's how I do it. See, I wasn't righteous. I'm a sinner, born in iniquity. But guess what? When I go into baptism, the Romans chapter 6 tells me that the old man of sin is what? Crucified with Christ. So I'm born again as a what? New. Righteous. New. Righteous. So what should my deeds be? Right. Righteous. The best way I try to explain this to people is this. There are two types of schools. One, where you have to work for the A. But there's another school that says, listen, I'm going to give you the A. You just need to keep it. That's the school of Christ. Christ gave us the A. He's already died and did it. He says, now I'm going to give you my righteousness. How do you keep that righteousness? By doing right things. That's how easy it is. See, I don't have to work for my salvation. Christ has already given it to me. All I have to do is keep it. Resisting the devil. Oh, hold on now. I know you want me to eat that. I know you want me to do that. But my Lord has already given me victory over that. Amen. That's it right there. Two spirits. Two spirits. One that lifts self up. One that tells you, put self down. Humble yourself. Those are the two spirits. No matter what you do, you're going you're gonna to exercise anything you do in those two spirits. It's just what it is. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. 
Mm. He cannot sin because he is born of God. Mm. Uh oh. The only way you sin is by yielding yourself to the devil. So long as you yield yourself to Christ, you will what? Not sin. What Christ says, I will keep you from. He can present you before the Father and keep you from falling. Do you believe that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Then why would he fall? See? That's unbelief. Look right here. He that committed sin is of what? Of the devil. Wait a minute. If you're committing sin, do you still have your A? Mm -hmm. yep. See, the moment you commit sin is the moment you separate yourself from God. And the devil tries to trick you into thinking you're all right when you're all wrong. The only way to be right is to go to God and get what? Forgiveness. Remember the Bible tells you, sin not first. But if you sin, you have a what? Advocate with the Father. But remember the first step is what? Sin not. God prefers, his order is that you what? Sin not. But he also doesn't want you to get discouraged if you sin. So he says, if you sin, come back to me, I'll make it right. Mm -hmm. Then what the devil tries to get you to do is forget the sin not and says, guess what? I can just keep asking for forgiveness. Do you see that deception? Yeah. As long as I ask for forgiveness, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Is that God's order? No. God's order is the what? Sin yeah. not. Yeah. You see how he, you see how easy he twitches it? And so people say, oh, well, I just, you know, so many people say, all I gotta do is pray about it, I'm good. Does the Bible say all you gotta do is pray? Yeah. What's the order to get forgiveness? Yeah. This, but if you sin, what's the order to get forgiveness? To you. Yes, but look what it says. That's not just asking for forgiveness. You have to what? <clears throat> That's it. That's it. Then you ask for forgiveness. And guess what? We just read Ezekiel 33. Without committing iniquity, you must turn from it. Those are things. It's not just simply asking for forgiveness. God forgives you when you confess it. Lord, I am wrong. I've committed sin. Then you ask, Lord, forgive me for that act. And as to show you sincereness, you what? Stop doing it. That's how you get forgiveness. That's the order that God has done. Satan changes that order, and all you do is say, Lord, forgive me. Mm -mm. You just say, Lord, forgive me. You're very easy, right? But what ends up happening when you just say, Lord, forgive me? You end up doing it again. Because you haven't followed the order. This is all about order. Whose spirit do you have? Listen to this right here. So in the dark ages, it says, Christ did not yield up his life till he had accomplished the work which he came to do. And with his parting breath, he exclaimed, It is finished, John 19.30. The battle had been won. His right hand and his holy arm had completed <coughs> the victory. As a conqueror, he planted his banner on the eternal heights. Was there not joy among the angels? All heaven triumphed in the Savior's victory. Satan was defeated and knew that his kingdom was lost. Oh, oh. Look at this. Oh, 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 please. Don't just skip over this. Satan was defeated and knew that his kingdom was lost. Yeah. If you have the winning lottery numbers, will you pick another number other than that? No. No, it would be stupid. Yes. Well, then why do you keep picking the losing side? <laughs> you see that? Satan knew himself that it was over with. And guess what he keeps doing to us? He keeps deceiving us, thinking that there's a chance that he could win. It's over. When Christ died on the cross, it was over. It's Amen. finished. People say, so many people get this wrong. <clears throat> it was finished because salvation was secure. What was finished was it was a guarantee. His character paved the way to salvation. Was it just for a... Remember we said earlier, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Let's see if the spirit of prophecy says that the victory that Christ had wasn't just for us. It was also for the angels and the unfallen worlds. Too often we read Revelation chapter 12 and 10, and it says they overcame him. They only talk about us. But that's not the case. The war was for the entire universe, the government of God. We're just one little part of it. So the war is over. Christ finished the war at the cross. The only thing left is this one planet. The rest of the universe is in harmony now. They're all back in order. But us. But us. 
<laughs> Thank you, exactly. Exactly, they're all back in order but us. Look what she goes on to say. And it says, to the angels and the unfallen world that cry, it is finished, had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of the <coughs> had been accomplished. They with us share the fruits of Christ's victory. Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. The uh, arch apostate had so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. Oh, 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 oh. Wow. I didn't highlight anything in this because the entire statement is something that we need to remember. If the angels could not understand and save themselves, think that they were deceived, how much more will we be deceived? Yeah. Oh, please get that. He keeps deceiving them. He closed it. My voice is right here. Was the redemption just for us? The great war crew redemption, was it just for us? No. no. It was for all. All intelligent beings, whether they be angels or beings on the other worlds, had to make a de decision. Matter of fact, in early writings, when Ellen White has a building, she goes and sees Enoch. And Enoch's on another world, sitting there reading a book. And he's, she's talking with him. And then he starts explaining that on that world, they had a tree too that they never touched. Amen. That's what she said. Go read early writings, look up the vision with Enoch. Just type in Enoch, read early writings, and you can read the vision. Every world had to decide whether they were going to join Satan or stick with God. Wow. So when the Bible says the accusing of the brethren, he wasn't just talking about us. Because Satan was constantly going to heaven, accusing the other worlds that they were fools for sticking with God. That's what he was doing. That's why it says, woe unto the heavens of the earth. Because up until Christ died on the cross, Satan was able to go to all the other two worlds and try to get them to eat from the tree. He was also going to the angels and saying, you're an idiot. You're foolish, you're dumb, you're a slave for sticking with God. They did not understand his character until Christ died on the cross. That's why they were redeemed. Because if I call you dumb or stupid for doing something, and then someone comes and vindicates that what you're doing is right, do you feel redeemed? Because now you're proving that what you chose was right. By Christ died on the cross, it showed the angels in the unfallen worlds that they had chosen the right side. That's what he did. So Christ, with him on the cross, ended the war in heaven. Amen. Yeah. What ended it though? Them recognizing, I want you to notice, them recognizing Satan's true character. The war in heaven was ended because the people in those in heaven and in the unfallen worlds recognized that Satan was a liar and they refused to listen to him. So, if that ended the war in heaven, what will end the war on earth? If we stop listening. There it is. See, we will vindicate God's character when we be obedient. See, when we stop listening to the devil and his angels, then we will replicate character. God's character in us. And the war will end on earth. Because remember there's a thing, there's a saying with Abraham, with Abraham that God said something about Abraham when he came to kill his son. He said, now I know that there is nothing that you will not do for me. You see, Abraham was tested. This is your only son. Can you offer him up? And Abraham said, I will. Not only that, Isaac, seeing that there was no offering, offering said, I will lay down. Yeah. Yeah. My mm -hmm. They got the victory. Yeah. They chose, rather than lifting self, to go and do what Christ did, self-sacrifice. Mm -hmm. The war will end here when we stop listening to Satan and understand his true deceptions. Then we better hurry. Mm -hmm. That's what it, that's what we're waiting on. Summary. The war in heaven was based on self-exaltation. God has set the order in the universe, 
in the heaven, in the angels' companies, and on the planets. God set the order. When we rebel against that order, we join Satan's rebellion. And Spirit of Prophecy tells us <coughs> the reason why people are not listening to us is because they see that we're not in order. They see it. They recognize that something is not right. We're supposed to be peculiar. But if we're doing everything they're doing, why do they need to come join us? So why should I listen to you? You're doing what I want to do. But you're telling me that I shouldn't be doing it. So why? Does that make sense to listen to you? So here's what she's saying. The spirit, because guess what? I want you to see something. The spirit that's standing behind them that are in the world is Satan's spirit. And they have, Satan has a good peace in their ear. So here you come to give them truth and the devils and the angels point out your hypocrisy to them. And they say, well, I don't need to listen. That thought comes in their mind from Satan because he understands that's his spirit. Can Satan cast out Satan? No. So whose spirit do you need to have? God's. Here it is right here. Satan used the arguments of rights to deceive the angels. Mm. The reason why I use the word feminism. Is feminism about rights, equal rights? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Who set the order? God did. The same arguments that Satan used to deceive the angelic host who saw all of heaven is the same arguments he's using to deceive us. There is nothing new under the sun. Absolutely nothing. Same arguments. And that's why I used it. Now remember, this is a how many part? Or four part. Mm -hmm. So we'll get into the other parts and I'll explain it. Bible and spirit of prophecy, feminism with men, feminism with women, and feminism in the church. Um, we'll explain that later. Thank you. But this is right here, this is, I just wanted to show you what took place in heaven, because if you can understand the war in heaven, you can recognize the war on earth, because it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same, there's no difference. And it's not about me or you, it's not about me or her, it's about Thus saith the word of God. Who will you decide to listen to? Amen. And so that's my appeal to you guys. Stop listening to the devil. How many people here, I don't want to see him. If everyone closed their eyes, if you want to renew your life with God, while everyone's eyes are closed, I'm going to pray. Just raise your hand. If there's something you're holding on to that you want God to give you victory over, I'm going to pray. And you have a silent prayer with God with your hand raised, recognizing that there's something you want God to remove from you. See, we don't need to show everyone our sins. God sees everything. And so we just need to go with our personal time as I pray. That you say, Lord, I'm struggling with this. Help me. So if there's something you're holding on to, raise your hand and allow God and reckon, let God see that you really want that. You see, you have to move. God can't force. It's voluntary. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you so much. Thank you again, Lord, for your love and your mercy and your kindness. Lord, thank you for allowing me to come up and speak. Even though I'm speaking, Lord, I too need my hand raised. I too have things that I'm struggling with. And Lord, it is our unbelief that's keeping us to join you in your victory. The devil was working hard to deceive all of us on something. No deception is any different than any other, Lord. If you're deceived on one thing, we're going to burn with those who are deceived on something different, Lord. Lord, you sent your son to die for us. And we acknowledge that. We have our hands raised to acknowledge that Christ gave us the victory. So, Lord, whatever it is, we just ask that you have mercy on us. Send your Holy Spirit to convict us and to give us strength. Help our unbelief. As we go throughout this day, Lord, it is your day, the Sabbath. And now that we have acknowledged the things that we're going with, Lord, take away any doubt. Don't let the devil come and convince us that you haven't recognized and you haven't given us the power to overcome that thing. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.